Remember that time in math class when you wondered, why do I need to know this? How does this apply to anything else? Sometimes the things you learn in math seem very arbitrary and very segregated. But today, I'm going to teach you the secret. The reason why calculus exists, because that's how all of math comes together. And you're going to see today the behind the scenes as to why functions and graphs look and behave the way that they do. So stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe and share this video with a fellow calculus student. This is one of my favorite lessons in calculus, and the reason is you are going to understand all those years of algebra and looking at graphs and functions and wondering, why does this matter? Or what does this relate to? Today, you're gonna to find that out. We're gonna be talking about increasing and decreasing functions. We're gonna talk about the first and second derivative test and the concavity of a graph. So the first thing we need to start with is looking at a general function, and let's walk through how do we figure this thing out. So let's look at the graph given here. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to write out the intervals where the function is increasing, decreasing, and constant. And then we're gonna look at some information with that. Okay, the first thing we're gonna find out is where is this function increasing? So let's look at the interval. Well, it starts increasing at negative one, right? Up until when x is one. Okay, this is where it's increasing. It's also increasing from three to infinity, okay? Now let's look at where the function is decreasing. The function is decreasing, let's see here, from one to three. So one to three, this is the decreasing. And I color coded these so you could follow along. And where is the function constant? It is constant from negative infinity to negative one. So now looking at these pieces, what is their slope doing at these places? You know we were gonna talk about slope because slope is derivative and this is calculus, right? So here we go. Let's look at the slopes. So everywhere this function is increasing. So it's increasing from negative one to one. Well, let's look at these slopes. What kind of slopes do we have here? We have positive slopes in the increasing areas, correct? Okay, now decreasing. Here's my decreasing part. What kind of slopes do we have here? We've got our negative slopes in the decreasing side. Oh, and back over here, this part is increasing again, and look what happens. These ones, are positive. And now let's look at where it's constant. What's the slope right here? Those are zero slopes. So what else did you notice when the graph changed from positive to negative slopes? What happened at the slopes? Yeah, at those points right at the very top, those slopes are also zero. So that's important to note as well. So we're gonna use this information to understand more of our graph. Here we go. So the way we decided if the function or the graph was increasing or decreasing was by looking at the slopes. If the slopes were positive, they're increasing. If they're negative, they're decreasing. So let's put that all together in our notes. So here's what we learned. When the graph is constant, right, the slope is zero. And what's another word for slope when you're talking calculus? You should know by now it's the derivative, right? So when we're talking slope, we're talking about the derivative. So when the graph is constant, the slope or the derivative will be zero. When it is increasing, the slope is going to be positive. And when the graph is decreasing, the slope is negative. So again, we're talking slope, which means we're talking derivative. So when you're given a function, you're gonna be finding the derivative and finding out when the derivative is constant, positive, or negative. Let's go. 
So let's find out when this function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. And we do that by finding the slope, which is the, yes, the derivative. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to find the derivative to decide where this thing is positive or negative or increasing or decreasing. Okay. So step number one is going to be finding the derivative. So step one, find derivative. dx is my abbreviation for derivative. So here we go. f prime of x equals 3x squared minus 6x. Check my work. Make sure you agree with my derivative. I'm taking it from this function up here at the top. Okay, so what do we do from here? Well, we just learned that when the slope equals zero, on either side of that, you're gonna have a positive or a negative slope. So the next thing we need to do is find out when this derivative equals zero. So step two, set derivative equal to zero and solve. So now I'm gonna take this guy. So zero equals three x squared minus six x. Now we just have to solve for zero. Use your algebra. The first thing I'm going to do is pull out what they have in common. So they both share a 3x. So I'm going to take that out. And then we're left with x minus 2. Now I can go ahead and set both of these equal to zero. So over here, I'm going to get x equals 2. And over here, x is going to equal zero. So these are the two places where our derivative equals zero. So we're going to use a number line analysis to figure out what else is positive or negative. Step three is going to be setting up our number line analysis. Three, set up number line analysis. We're going to put our zeros on this number line. So we know that when x was zero and when x was two, our derivative, our slopes were zero. Now we're gonna figure out in between these and on either side if they're positive or negative. And remember, it was our slopes, which means our derivative, when they were positive or negative, that told us about the original function. So when we're trying to figure out if these areas are positive or negative, we're going to use the derivative equation. So let me write that in. We're going to use our derivative equation to figure out which interval is positive and negative. So I'm going to rewrite our derivative equation. It's 3x squared minus 6x. You don't have to put in specific numbers. You can just put in a number that falls into that interval. So for example, we want numbers to the left side of 0. So I'm going to be putting in negative numbers. Right here, if I put in a negative number, this would be... 3 times a negative number squared, right, negative number squared, minus 6 times some negative number, okay? Well, right here, when you square a negative, that guy becomes positive, and he's pretty big because you're squaring him. And over here, you're going to take a negative times a negative, which is a positive, which means this whole thing is going to be positive. So that's how you figure out that area. Now, you could put in a specific number like negative one, but sometimes it's better just to put in generalities and just to think about it. So we put it in our negative number and this area in here is gonna be positive. Now let's do the second area. I'll do between zero and two. Between zero and two, I'm obviously gonna put in one. So if I put in one here to this problem, we're gonna get three minus six, which is gonna give us a negative answer. So this area is gonna be negative. Make that better negative. And now let's check out beyond two. So if you just put in a positive number to this guy and square it, minus six times a positive number. So let's look at the area on the right. If you put in a positive number, right, and square it, it's going to be bigger than six times that positive number by itself. All right, even if you put in three, it will work. So this area over here is going to end up being a positive. So here is your positive value. So what's our function going to look like? It's going to be increasing until it hits zero. It's going to decrease until it hits two. And then it is going to increase beyond two. This is how you would figure out your number line analysis.
and how you figure out which intervals are increasing and decreasing and at what points they're going to be constant. And we actually have a special name for these values where the derivative is zero. So in this case, it was zero and it was two. And the special name for these points are called critical points. Get your notebook ready. I'm going to give you a definition. You have to write this in your notes. The special name, again, is called critical points. Critical points are when the first derivative equals zero or at any undefined points. So for example, if you were to have a fraction and an x value in the denominator that makes the function not exist, those would also be considered critical points. This is your critical point for your first derivative test. It tells you when the function is increasing, decreasing, and when it is constant. Now another point that you're going to see in this graph, if we go back up to the number line analysis here for a minute, the other thing that you're going to get to see on this number line analysis is where there might be a min or a max point in the function. And this is a relative min or max. Not for the whole function, but where the function might have a min or a max hump or point in the graph. So in this case, you can easily see by drawing in those lines, when x equals zero, you're going to have a maximum point. It's called a relative max. And at when x equals two, you're going to have a relative min point because that's where the graph will bottom out. So with your first derivative test, you have critical points and you have your relative min and max. Now your second derivative is going to tell you about the concavity of a function. All right, it's going to tell you whether or not the function is smiling or if it's frowning. So now we're going to write out the first derivative. Take the second derivative to figure out the next steps. So our first derivative was 3x squared minus 6x. So again, step one is going to be finding the derivative. Find second derivative. So second derivative, f double prime of x is going to equal 6x minus 6. Guess what step two is going to be? Same steps as last time. So we're going to set the derivative equal to zero. Set second derivative equal to zero and solve. So could I just bring this down here. Zero equals six x minus six. Do some algebra, pull out your six. So we've got zero equals six, which doesn't work, or zero equals x minus 1, so x is going to equal 1. That's where the second derivative equals 0. And now step 3, just like in the previous step, number line analysis. So step 3 is going to be doing our number line analysis with our x value being 1. So we're putting in our number line analysis here. I'm labeling 1 because that's when our second derivative is 0. Now I need to figure out to the left and to the right of 1 if our second derivative is positive or negative to decide if it's smiling or frowning. So we're going to write out our second derivative again and put in some numbers to figure these two spaces out. All right, our second derivative was 6x minus 6. If we put in a number less than 1, you could easily stick zero in here. If you put zero in here, what are you going to get? A negative six. So everything on this side is going to be negative. Now, if you put in a number greater than one, okay, it's a positive number, six times a positive number, minus six is still going to be positive. So this side is positive. So therefore, what we have is your function will be concave down before when x is one, and it will be concave up after x is 1. And this, of course, has a special name to it as well. These are called inflection points. So inflection points are with your second derivative, and they are when the second derivative, where it equals 0, and, and, this is key, it must change from positive to negative or vice versa. It must change concavity for it to be considered an inflection point. Get this in your notes right now.
All right, so a quick reminder. When the second derivative is negative, the graph is concave down. When the second derivative is positive, the graph is concave up. So make sure again, you have that in your notes as well. So now that we have all this information using the first and second derivatives, we're gonna graph this function using that information. So the first thing you need to do is you need to find the y partners to those critical points and those inflection points. The critical points were from the first derivative. Those are the numbers on our number line analysis. And the second derivative is that inflection point. We gotta pull the zero from that number line analysis. I know, it's a lot. Okay, so let's think back. So our critical points, I'm gonna call them CP points, and inflection points are gonna be our IP points. So our critical points where x equals zero and two, and our inflection point was when x equaled one. But since we wanna graph the original function, we have to put these x values into the original function and find their y partners. First, we're gonna find our critical point y partners. So I'm gonna plug in zero to my f function, and again, that's my blue function up here, right? If I put in zero for x, the first two drop out, I'm left with one, okay? So here's our first ordered pair, zero, one. Now I'm gonna do the second critical point, so f of two, and I'm gonna just plug it into our function. It is x cubed minus three x squared plus one. Now it's just some algebra. We have two cubed is eight, Two squared is four times three is 12 plus one. So eight minus 12 is negative four plus one is negative three. So f of two equals negative three. So we have the ordered pair two, negative three. We have two of our ordered pairs. Those are our critical point ordered pairs. Now we need to find our inflection point when x equals one. I'm gonna do that one up here. So f of one is going to be one cubed minus three times one squared plus one. So f of one equals three minus one, negative two, plus one is negative one. So we have one, negative one. And that is our inflection point that we'll need to graph as well. The first thing I'm gonna do is graph these points on my x, y axis. Now this can just be a rough estimate. It doesn't have to be exact. It's just for you to get a basic idea of how this works. So let's see, I'm gonna need negative three on my y axis. One, two, three, so I'll just do three in each direction. Good enough. So I've got one, negative one. So one, negative one. And this right here is an inflection point. So I'm gonna label that so I don't forget. Now I've got zero, one, that's right up here. And this is a critical point. That's where it's gonna change from increasing to decreasing. And two, negative three. And this is a critical point. This is where you need to go back to your number line analysis. And we have to look, this is our first critical point we, we hit when x is zero. When x was zero, was our function increasing or decreasing? So let's go back and look. So we're gonna go back and look at our number line analysis from the first derivative. And when you look at this number line analysis, you see the function is increasing, decreasing, increasing, which it should because this is an x cubed graph. And hopefully you know your x cubed graph looks like this, right? <laughs> if not, graph y equals x cubed and all x cubed graphs will have this shape to it. So we'll know that it's increasing until zero, decreasing until two, and then increasing after two. Then the second piece of information you need to look at is the second derivative number line analysis. When you look at this piece, it's gonna tell you if the function should be concave up or concave down. 
So what you'll notice is until x is 1, it's all going to be shaped down. But after 1, it's all going to be concave up. So when we're drawing in our graph with a rough hand, we're going to need to acknowledge that in our graph. All right, so we learned that we're going to be increasing until 0 and concave down. So we're going to be increasing until 0 and concave down. Notice how the shape is kind of going down. Now we're still going to be concave down, but we're going to be decreasing, but still concave down. And at an inflection point is where you change concavity. So we're still decreasing, but now the function is going to be concave up. See how it has a little bit more of a smile to it than a frown? Then again, at that critical point, we change from decreasing to increasing. So from here, it's going to go right on up. And again, it doesn't have to be super specific. The main idea is that you're showing the changes in increasing and decreasing, and you're showing the change in your concavity at your inflection point. Here are some important things I want you to get in your note. So get out a special sheet of paper, something that you will easily see, maybe a different colored piece of paper, something that you can easily take out when you're doing your work. So what you need to remember, first derivative test, tells you about increasing and decreasing and your max and your min. They are called critical points when the first derivative equals zero or when it's undefined. A quick side note, some books will talk about stationary points. Stationary points are only when the first derivative equals zero, not if they're undefined. So quick clarification, make sure you know the difference between critical points and stationary points. And your first derivative test also tells you about relative max and min. If you want to know about absolute max and min, check out my other video where that will be fully explained. The other part to get in your notes, the second derivative test. This will tell you about concavity. If it is positive, it's concave up. If it's negative, it's concave down. And that special name is called the inflection points. It's when the second derivative equals zero and it must Change concavity, super important. I'm gonna do one more example with you really quick. We're not gonna graph this one. We're just going to find your critical points, your inflection points, and max and min. So let's go. Again, step one, look back at your notes if you have to, is take the derivative. So the first derivative equals 4x minus 4x cubed. Second step, set it equal to zero. And now you're going to solve. So I'm going to do some fun algebra here and pull out what I know. One minus, and this would be x squared. Oh, zero equals four x, which means x equals zero is one of your critical points. And then you have zero equals one minus x squared. So I'm gonna move x squared over. So if you take the square root of both sides, x is gonna equal plus or minus one. So technically you have three critical points. Next step, number line analysis. Do your number line analysis here, and you've got negative one, zero, and one as your spots where your derivative is equal to zero. Now we gotta plug in. So let's find our derivative again. So our derivative was four x minus four x cubed. So now I have to plug in a number less than negative one, okay? Okay, if I plug in a number less than negative one, this piece is gonna be negative, because you're plugging in a negative, minus four times a negative cubed. Well, a negative cubed is gonna be negative, times another negative is gonna be positive, and this is a small negative number compared to this guy. So this guy is gonna be positive, so this side is a positive. Now let's look between negative one and zero. So what are we gonna put in? Well, it's still gonna be a negative number, right? But this is gonna be less than one. So if this x value is less than one, means he's gonna be a fraction and he's gonna be small, especially once you cube him. So this number will be negative but this is gonna be positive. 
but this negative number will still be bigger than this guy. So this is gonna be negative. And again, honestly, if you're not sure, stick it in your calculator and put in a value, put in negative 0.5 if you need to, to get an answer. But really, you should be able to think through these, okay? Okay, so we talked through that. Now let's go a positive value here. So this would be four times a positive number minus four times a positive number cubed. Okay, and currently right now, we're talking about like 0.5. Right, again, if you cube a fraction, he's gonna get smaller, and this guy's gonna be bigger than this guy. So this is gonna be positive. Okay, you're putting in a number now greater than one. If you put a number greater than one, this guy's still gonna be positive, but a number greater than one cubed is gonna be way bigger than this guy, and there's a negative sign between them. So this guy's gonna end up being negative. So when you do your increasing and decreasing lines, we're increasing until negative one, decreasing until zero, increasing until one, and then decreasing after one. So now we need to find out where our relative min and max will be, looking at our lines. Let's first look at our relative max. We have two peaks here at negative one and one, that will be the runoff, let's say, for our relative max point. So relative max. Our options are x equals negative 1 or x equals 1. To find their y partners, we plug it into the original equation to find out who their y partners are. Our original equation was 2x squared minus x to the fourth. Let's find out their y partners. For x equals negative 1, 2 times negative 1 squared minus negative 1 to the fourth. f of negative 1 is going to equal, negative 1 squared is 1, 2. This is, that's going to be 2, minus, Negative one to the fourth is just one, minus one is gonna be one. So this is f of negative one equals one. That's one option for the relative max. Now, what happens when you plug in positive one to that equation? Is anything gonna change? Nope. So actually in this case, you have two relative max points and they both have the same y value, which is totally fine. Doesn't always happen, so you have to plug in your x values to your original equation to find out who his y partner is. So in this case, you have a relative max at both of these points. Now your relative min is pretty easy because we're not looking at the whole graph. So we're not looking at everything that goes to negative infinity and everything that goes to positive infinity. So you can easily just acknowledge right here that your relative min will be at x equals zero. Again, if you wanna talk more about absolute max and min, watch my other video where we will discuss absolute max and min. Now we just have to find concavity and our inflection points. So again, remember, concavity and inflection points are second derivative. So our first derivative we had is 4x minus 4x cubed, and then f double prime of x, is gonna be four minus 12 x squared. Second step, set it equal to zero and solve. And at this point, I'm also going to pull out a four. One minus three x squared. So my options are zero equals four, which is nothing, or zero equals one minus three x squared. So now we have to use some algebra and solve for that. So I'm gonna move my three x squared to the other side because I don't like dealing with negative numbers. I'll divide both sides by three. X squared equals one third. How do you get rid of a squared? Square root, and of course you must acknowledge it could be positive or negative, which means x is gonna equal positive or negative the square root of one over three. So we have a number line analysis. We have negative square root one over three. And then we have positive square root one over three, and these are both where the second derivative equals zero. Now we're gonna use the second derivative to find out concavity and if it changes. So our second derivative 
was 4 minus 12x squared. So the first thing we're going to do is plug in a negative number way to the left side of this guy. So if I plug a negative number in here and square him, he will be positive. But I have a small number minus a bigger positive, right? So this guy is going to be negative. Now in between, we can use zero because it makes life so easy. If you put a zero in here, you're going to get four. He's positive. Whew. Easy. Now we're going to put in a positive number. Again, if you square a positive number, he'll still be positive, but you're doing four minus some big number. So this guy is going to be negative. So when you look at your concavity, he's frowning, he's smiling, he's frowning. So therefore, since the concavity changes at each of these points where the second derivative equals zero, both of these guys would be your inflection points. Depending on what the book or your teacher wants, you would plug those into the original function to find your y partners for those inflection point x values. Did you realize there was this much calculus behind every function and every graph that you've ever looked at up until calculus? It's crazy, I know, right? Did your world just come full circle and did huge light bulbs go off? And now you're like super excited to share this with everybody? Okay, I get it if you're not. But this is why I love calculus, because it comes full circle and you see exactly why functions and graphs behave the way that they do. Please make sure you subscribe and share this with another calculus student. Let me know in the comments below if you have anything that you would want me to discuss in a video or if you have any comments or questions. Have a great day.